Welcome to the Sure Sales Group Show, episode 36. I'm here with my longtime friend and mentor, Matthew Newberger. And Matt, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, your company, so they can get to know you better. Sure. Well, um, I run a company called Newberger & Company. We're based out of Baltimore. We have offices in D.C., Baltimore, but we work all over the world. What we focus on is growing companies. And specifically, we provide training and consulting for salespeople, and I think some of the best salespeople in the world, and uh, as well as leadership and management. So we provide all the systems, all the training, so that they can be the best they can be. They can get as many clients as they want, and they can keep them for as long as they want. That's sort of the simple version. So obviously you can tell why we had him on the show. And I wanted to tell my story and my kind of exposure to you at a young age. I've talked about it a lot on other episodes and just in interactions. And I kind of leverage your training as why you should hire me a lot of times. But when I was 22, I ended up kind of falling into an environment where Matt was training me for free. Because it's, very, it's not yep. cheap to get this level of training. <laughs> I, I found that out when my free ride was over. <laughs> Um, but Matt was training me, yeah. and I was so into it and into this culture of how to be the best and at sales and negotiation and marketing and leadership and using the techniques. And at the time, I was in a situation where I was using the techniques all the time because I'd sold cars for nine months out of college with a finance degree, 2009, a hard, hard time for finance. But I was using these sales techniques that Matt was showing me and his team and his coaches and I was making a lot of money as a 22-year-old. So fast forward, I've been using your coaching and your methodologies for the last eight years in our sales team. And I think that's a big reason we've had hockey stick growth. And I know my partner, Joe Sacchetti, would say the same, is our approach to how we interact with clients is rooted in what you guys do. And, and pretty much Thanks. how I do business I kind of try to look at it through a lens of how does this work within the Sandler system and how Newberger and company does it because obviously it works. So yeah, we've, we, I mean, we've used it to grow our company, which is kind mm -hmm. of a neat thing. I mean, we get to use all the things that you know, we teach you and other people to grow right. our business. So everything we do, we've tested on ourselves first, and there's a lot of stuff we test we hate, so you never see it. Right. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's been um, something that has been really fun to use on ourselves and to watch you use. Yeah. to grow your business. It's been really rewarding. You grew from nothing. Yeah, so. now I was broke and now I'm not, so it's great. <laughs> That's what we like to see. But what I find is salespeople, now in real estate, and I said this in the, in the previous episode, but most realtors have zero sales training, and that's why 85% of them fail, only 15% of them move on past the first three or four years. Right. And it takes 10,000 hours to be good at anything, but sales in, in general, in real estate, no one has any training. Right. And I feel like in a lot of these companies, every company is selling something, but if the training is not there, the plight is, is just obvious for a lot of these people. So you guys put out a white paper called Why Do Salespeople Fail? I read it. It's very thought-provoking. But could you sum up kind of what you see when you're bringing on these sales teams? What are the holes you're seeing? What are the gaps? What do you guys fix first? Well, I mean, one thing that you're bringing up that happens in real estate agents a lot is, is people sort of have this scarcity mindset, and that is... is I can't afford training. And, you know, certainly it's, you know, we look at it as how could you not afford training? I mean, if you think about it, if you would invest in a house or the stock market or anything, why would you not at least consider investing in yourself first? What's going to give you the highest dividend? And it sounds cliche, but a lot of people have this very scarcity mindset, and that's where everything starts. So if you're not, if you're not willing to invest in yourself, and we do talk to a lot of agents, and they're just like, yeah, you know, 100 bucks a month sounds like a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm not making anything yet, or, right. you know, I'm not doing enough deals, or I don't get enough percentage from my, you know, from my company to, to make that make sense. And we know, I mean, I hate to say it, but we, we're not there to convince anybody that they need to get better. They've got to come with that. You had that. Right. So what I would say is, is that you, why salespeople fail? 90% 90, 90 of it, not maybe 95, but there's no accurate measurement, but 90% sure. of it is because your psychology is wrong. The mindset. The mindset is wrong. I mean, listen, we gave you the mechanics, but you were ready for the mechanics. And yeah. I think a lot of people, um, and it's not real estate agents, but I think it's, it's anybody that has talked themselves into, if they spend money, they're going to lose it. 
And as a result of that, they never invest in themselves and they continue to kind of struggle along. That's the scarcity mindset? That's the scarcity mindset. You know, there's a saying that it's true. It's when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So yep. I like what you said there. And I stopped chasing people and stopped trying to train people who weren't hungry for it. Because if you're not hungry for it, you can't smash training down someone's throat. They just don't right. care. It just rubs off them. It just beads off like a repellent. Right. But if they're ready for it, they soak it up. Right. So to, to that point, I mean, if you think of it this way, it's, you know, we, we had this wonderful saying, some will, some won't, so what, move on. And Say it, it again. It, some will, some won't, so what, move on. And the, right. the philosophy that we're talking about is one that you get really well, which is why I think you've been successful. And the philosophy is, is that selling isn't about jamming things down people's throat or a bad right. product down people's throat. Selling is about getting to the truth and figuring out whether the person or the entity, the company that's sitting in front of you is actually somebody that is both willing and able to do business with you. Why would you waste your time with somebody that has no money? Why would you waste your time with somebody that will never, ever get your value? Right. I mean, well, how do you get to the truth? And just one quick, you said $100 a month. I know it's more expensive than that. So don't get your hopes up. I know there's probably a lot of realists, realtors out there, other salespeople like, for 100 bucks a month, I can come? Yeah. He'll train me? Yeah. That's yeah. definitely not happening. But um, where was I going with that? You said... How do you get to the truth? How do you get to the truth? Yeah, yeah. That's the big question. Yeah, it is. And I think that if you look at traditional selling, and there's a lot of people out there, and we know their names, but they're all over the internet. And what right. they're talking about is you know, just the psychology piece. How do you psych yourself up? How do you tell people what you're going to do? And I think all that's good, but at the end of the day, you really have to be able to very quickly, the smartest people, the best people, if you watch a CEO that has been classically trained and they walk into a boardroom and they talk about, you know, maybe multi-billionaires sitting around the table, they're talking about some big investment they're going to make. What they do very quickly is they're trying to get to the point. Yeah. And they're trying to understand whether those people are willing to participate at the level they're going to need to participate at. So to get to the truth, what you really have to have are some critical elements, which is what we talk about and why salespeople fail is the mechanics. But I'll give you an example. The first thing you have to do is you really have to understand how to set up a conversation, right? And most people get into a If you think about it, if, any, if, if anyone were watching and they, and they thought, all right, I have a business meeting of some sort coming up in the future, maybe even it's just a conversation with your spouse, but it's, does that other person know where you're going? Where, where do you want to get to by the end of the conversation? Right. And if you're a master at that, you can control any situation. And I mean any. And I'm willing to, you know, someone can call me out and say you can't, but. No, it's true. And that's, I've talked about it on the very surface level before. And what you're alluding to is having a really good upfront contract. It's right. kind of setting the stage for how this meeting's going to go. Kind of inspecting what you expect. It's a line you say a lot. Inspect mm -hmm. what you expect. And how you do that is by making sure everyone's on the same page before you start. Because the sooner you can save some time and energy and probably money, you want to do that. Right. Now, the thing is, is this is where the psychology comes back into play, Andrew, because a lot of people feel uncomfortable telling people what they actually want. And if you're not okay with that, you are going to be giving up ground to other people because they may not know what they want either, or they may want something that's in conflict with what you want. So Do you need to tell them what they want? You need to tell them what you want. Right, and make sure it's in alignment with what they want. Right, so if I'm coming into a meeting with you and, and I want to buy a big house and I have a budget, that I want to spend. What I don't want to do is waste a lot of time with you going back and forth with the seller. Right. What I want to be able to do is come to you and say, Andrew, bottom line, here's what has to happen. If this can't happen, tell me now. Let's not waste our time on this transaction. That's so powerful. And it's my job and a good real estate agent's job is to help the buyer, seller, client come to that conclusion. So there's the art to that too. This is the pre, pre, pre sale. It's getting to the truth of what you want and can I deliver it? And if I know I can't deliver on something that someone wants, and this is something, all the stuff stuff I've kind of got from osmosis and being in this classroom for years for every session, yep. is I'm getting the hell out of there if I can't deliver. And that saves the embarrassment, the shame, the time, the, the anxiety that comes along with this job. Like, I love getting the no. I love telling other people no. Now, it's rare because we're just talking to people about buying and selling homes, and all of our systems are designed to do that. Right. But it is refreshing when someone says, hey, I want to... 
like we were talking earlier about real estate investment, and we're talking about syndication across the country for good markets. Like, I know I'm not there, so I can say, hey, Matt, great. I'm not going to talk to you anymore about it because I don't know anyone in Tempe, Arizona, where the market's appropriate for you to buy this multifamily. Right. So that's great. Right. Now we don't have to talk about it anymore. Right. But, I mean, a good way for your, you know, I don't know if you have any other agents that watch this this show, and, and, and you should be they watching. They probably but... don't, but hopefully you're still watching. <laughs> <laughs> But how many of them, if they asked themselves honestly, would say, I'm working with a client right now that just frustrates, frustrates me to no end because they won't listen to me. That's everyone across the board. That's every real person. They're not the taking my advice. Right. They're not, you know, if somebody hires you, they're not hiring you to simply perform a transaction. They're hiring you for your expertise. Right. So if they're frustrated, it's probably because they don't have good expectations with that client. Right. They haven't explained to the client where they bring value and what results they intend to get with that client. So the client doesn't know when to listen, when to take advice, when to take action, when to take action. And if they're not hiring you for that and the client's really running you around, then you don't have a good upfront contract. You're there as a professional to tell that client how to get their objectives met. That's perfect. And I do that, and I try to do it, and it's hard when you're dealing with all these clients all the time, but that's why a real sales professional makes this and why an untrained, trying to make their car payment salesperson makes this. It's because it's all about the psychology and the upfront contract. Because another thing, one of your gems that I have like burned into my brain is you are going to be part of your plan that you set for this whole situation, or you're going to be part of their plan. And their plan, you might not like their plan if they're going to run you around and make you open up <laughs> they don't 60 think around think, They don't sit around thinking, you know, in part of my plan, I want my agent or my salesperson or my manager to get really rich and happy. <laughs> That's not what they're thinking no. about. They're and thinking they should. about, what do I get? How do I get what I want? And I'm not sure what I want, so I'm going to lead this salesperson or agent or whoever it is around until I can finally figure that out. There's a great session you guys do on that, which is the buyer's process and, yeah. and the other process, which is a great... Um, all these sessions are great, and we can kind of, you know, we'll include some B-roll, Brandon, if you want to throw up, like, right now, throw up the pain or the bond and rapport, the upfront contract, well, the pain budget. Well, we should tell them kind of what normally happens first. Tell them what normally happens. Right, so the whole reason we came up with why salespeople fail is because what we saw was when people were in any sort of a situation where they had to influence somebody else, and influence and sales, I use the two words synonymously. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, that's what selling is. No matter what you're doing in your life, your power to influence other people determines your income and your happiness, period, end of sentence. You agree? Agree. Okay. So in order to influence people, the first thing is, is you have to have more conviction. You have to have more confidence. You have to have more certainty in what you believe than that other person. The person with more certainty is always going to influence the other person. Makes sense. Yeah, now, yeah. the problem with that is, if, based on that statement, what buyers typically do is they use a process where first they act interested. They mislead about interest. Hey, I'm looking for, uh, you know, let, let's use software as an example. Hey, uh, I'm interested in your software. Right. Right? Tell me a little bit more about it, which leads us to step two, which is to gather information. Right. Okay, the problem with gathering information is, is that the salespeople, in order to create rapport, give as much as they can and think at that point they're gaining credibility. But actually what they're doing is they're losing all of their leverage. I'm not saying don't share anything, but what the buyer wants you to do is to share everything. Right. Your price, how you do it, who your competitors are, because they want you to educate them. So they mislead, they gather information. The third step is they act enthusiastic but commit to nothing. This is where most salespeople give a proposal of some sort. They act enthusiastic and commit to nothing. I've, I'm playing back situations in my head where I probably wasn't as ready to take on and set an appropriate agenda and take control of the meeting, and this is exactly what happens. We're interested, give us all the information, oh, we're excited, I'm not buying anything. And then what's the next piece? Well, listen, the reason they act enthusiastic is because they want to come back to you for more information later, but they don't want to pay for it. I see this across every industry. If you're I think I just did this to the car guy. I just bought a car. I think I did that <laughs> model to them. Yeah. Yeah, gimme, gimme, gimme. No, 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 I'm not, but gimme, gimme, gimme. Okay, cool, cool, great. No, you're great. This is great. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Yep. And I'd actually never bought a car from that guy. Of course not. But the thing is, is they don't know what else to do from there, so they give you what you want. Right. Now, the problem with this is, as time goes on, the sale for that salesperson, that car salesperson, gets harder and harder because now they're chasing you. And what are you doing? If you're not, not returning their calls. Yeah, right. I don't want to have that. Like, so we, yeah. we, we, we call that avoid, hide, you, you name it. 
but right. the fourth step is hide. So the buyer system typically consists of this. And if people, I always ask people, have you ever done that to somebody? And inevitably, everybody in the hand, everyone in the room raises their hand and says, yeah, I've done that to people. Now, I don't think that's because people are bad. It's because people aren't educated. And so this is the only system they know how. The problem with it is it takes all the control away. It does not make it an adult-to-adult -adult relationship. And as a result, salesperson turns into a pest. Right. That's what most salespeople are fearful of. I'm just pestering these people, following up, following up. I gave them everything they wanted. Now they're not calling me back, and i got to be a pest. Oh, it's better than that. They get pissed. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, they get upset. They're like, okay, so, you know, I've done all this work, and they start to tell themselves a story about how this is so unfair. And either they get out of sales because they think they're no good at it, it and I always say, okay, so you can quit sales, but sales doesn't quit you. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're going to suck at it forever. You're going to suck at it forever. But you're going to have to influence <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah, your whole life. You can't quit in sales. There's, no, there's nobody on the planet that doesn't have to You sell. know where I see this a lot and where I think in, in the real estate industry as a whole could really benefit from this is in the mortgage lending. It's such a commodity-based thing. And I see lenders all the time saying, I went over all the numbers with them. Hmm. I gave them everything. I have all their information. And they went to Quicken Loans or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. And I don't have the heart to tell them a lot of times. These are all my friends, good relationships I have, mortgage yeah. partners and realtors. They're, you know, they're peanut butter and jelly. I'm like, dude, it's because you didn't control that right. properly up front. Right. You set it up to give a proposal at the end and not get a commitment. And because you didn't get a commitment, they're going to, once they've made a decision they're ready to buy, they're going to go to the first person they talk to. So congratulations for helping to educate them, but right. you didn't do anything to sell them. So how do you, how do you stop that from happening? Well, you know, you got to look at the system that Sandler's talking about and the system that we use and that you've learned is, first of all, I've got to undo all that. I've got to stop setting myself up to give all this information and then, to, you know, chase at the end. That's a problem. That leads to inefficiencies. I'm never getting to the truth. I'm never finding out what the buyer wants to buy. So right. you've got to qualify them. So a lot of times what I do, just kind of keep it simple for, the, for, for right. people here because it's, it's more. This is like a five-day, everyday, yeah. three, two-hour sessions per segment training that we, you're going over real yeah, quick. For our academy, it's a five-day academy just to immerse people in this. Just so, in that little po portion of it. Th th we're talking about here yeah. and how managers, CEOs use this. And the CEOs, it's funny because we always think the salespeople are going to, they're going to be the ones that use the most. But the CEOs come to us and say, I'm using this in my meetings. I'm using this with the board. And I'm getting much better results. I'm able to control yeah. the conversation. Who doesn't want the truth? Right. That's it. When you look at it that way, rather than it's a manipulative process, which is, again, that 90% psychology problem is I right. just think I'm manipulating people. If you think you're doing that, sure. You know, who's going to want to continue to do that? But to the system, I think, you know, the thing is, is that you have to kind of put three major components in the right order if you're going to be a master of influence. And so I ask people, and this, we'll, let, we'll let everybody kind of think about this here for a second, but if, if you put close, qualify, and present in their proper order, what order would those three words come in? I'll give them to you again. Close, qualify, and present. What order do those go in? What do you think most people say? Most people probably go qualify, present, close. That's right. logical. Right. And what I would say is that's what leads to the problem of hiding. Right. You qualify, and most people qualify lightly. Statistically, so if you want to go to Info USA and look this up, there's all these statistics. But exit interviews from a buyer, a buyer-seller interaction. They Info USA did this, and they followed a bunch of buyers and sellers around. Yeah, right. And they asked the buyers, like, how well do you think that salesperson understood your needs in your company? And they asked the salesperson the same question: How well did you understand the needs in the company? Right. Salespeople typically said 86% of the time they understood the needs of the company and the person really well. The buyers, on the other hand, about 8% said the salespeople understood. <laughs> it's because they were presenting the whole time instead of qualifying a little harder. So this is the problem. Most people don't actually, un they don't go deep enough in understanding and qualifying the client. What they're looking to do, if you just look at the balance of talking and listening in a, in a typical sales process, right. salesperson in an hour meeting should be talking for 18 minutes, Right. So That'd they, be about 30% they of the need time. to learn to shut up. That's the biggest. I've if seen, I could run a training yeah. where you did nothing, but I just said, Andrew, just go in there and don't say anything. It would be better than what 90% of the population <laughs> is doing. Just sit there and say, yeah. so I hear you're interested in whatever. And just let them talk. People love to talk. And write notes. Yeah. Just do that. 
that would be better than 90% of the people that are out there now. Those, go ahead. Yeah, well, so you had the three things. What order should they be in? All right. So back to the three things. So yeah. the first thing you should really do is you should qualify. Qualify still one. Qualify. But here's the difference. When I talk about qualifying, what I'm talking about is getting down to the personal needs, the buy buttons. Everybody has a buy button. And we show you how to get to it. I mean, right, it would right. be heavy to get to it here. And we could certainly talk well, about this and, one yeah, right. in a particular episode. But everybody has a way they buy. And they have reasons they buy. And those reasons aren't intellectual reasons. They're right. emotional reasons. Always. But we tend to go to the intellectual. And you can look at any TV commercial, a lot of times these commercials are talking about the technical aspects of a product or a service or a solution or something like that, and they're way off. Right. But actually makes people buy is an emotion. Then they justify intellectually. Have you ever made an emotional purchase and then justified it recently? I, all the time. All the time. <laughs> no, I needed this. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yeah, no, I needed that. Saves me. It, it's going to save me a lot of money. So yeah. I've done that. So <laughs> yeah. we've all done that, and, and I'm sure you're, you're, the people watching this have done this too. So what I say is, is you should, one, qualify, but qualify deeply. To qualify, you need to qualify three things. You need to qualify their pain or their compelling reasons to do business. In their words, not yours. Your words matter not at all. Whatever your opinion is on why they need whatever it is you sell are wrong. And the only reason they're wrong is because they're not in the buyer's words. You must gather from the buyer, in their words, what it is they want and why they want it on an emotional level. That's one. And by the way, most salespeople don't get there from the stats I shared you earlier. Right. So they already are missing because they're talking at this point, not listening. I can look at you and I can say, okay, Andrew, you just told me you sold your house, but you don't have a new house. So I can infer from that that you need to buy a house and you need to buy a house right now. I got to this point and somebody said, I really, really need this. I'm emotionally involved. It has to happen, but I have no money. I don't have to become a salesperson and convince them that they have to do anything. All I do at this point is simply sort of say, well, how do you, how do you solve that problem? You've just told me you have this massive need. It's got to be solved. We've got to solve it now, but we have no money. How are you going to solve that problem? And then I let them sit back and you, you let them sit back and think, well, I could, you know, they start thinking about the buckets of money they could go get. Right. And, but I don't jump in there because my information is not going to be valuable here. Theirs is. People don't argue with themselves. Right. They, they that, never, that's the key. They don't argue with their own data. People don't argue with their own data. I've been saying this for years. The best objection, the best answer to any objection ever of why they can't buy, you simply just ask them, how do, they, how do you want to handle that? Oh, you don't have the money. Interesting. How do you guys want to handle that? <laughs> and they just solve their own problems, but like the, 90% of the time. But the psychology, to your, I mean, this is, that's a perfect example. The psychology of most people in sales, they think that's where they're supposed to step in and solve the problem. It's the exact wrong thing. It's funny because a lot of people, and you included, have said in the past, it's not that hard when you understand the right mechanics. Yeah. Because this isn't your, as a salesperson, it's not your time to work. This is where they work, and you sit right. back and let them solve the problem. It's not your, they gave you, it's not your problem. Right. They, they give you a problem they have to solve. So yeah. when people give me problems that aren't mine to solve, I, I say, huh, this isn't mine. Here, here's your problem. How are you going to solve it? <laughs> here's your problem back. I don't want it. Yeah. It's not mine. Here's a funny thing I say to people, and this is not sales related. It's just funny. When someone has a problem, I say, hey, you know what's neat about that? Not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard that in, in one of these rooms, and it made sense, too. It's like, yeah. You could try to solve it, but you don't know anything about these people. You're not that deep in the situation yet, so don't try. Well, it's even, it, it, you know, the funny thing is it, what happens is when you try to solve somebody else's problem and they're not sure if they want it solved, they just keep giving you another excuse. There's another excuse right behind you. Yeah. Well, yeah, that wouldn't work because. And no, that's not. And the next thing you know as a salesperson, you're trying to help them. You've actually engaged in a process of actually creating stalls and objections for yourself. And you think the buyer's doing it to you as a salesperson, right. but you as a salesperson actually created this stall and objection situation. So don't jump in and help where it's theirs. It's give it back to them. Say, so how would you solve that? It's, it, it's malpractice. Think of it if you were a doctor. It's like committing malpractice. If you yeah. try to solve a problem you don't understand. Yeah, that was benign. You didn't right. need to take that out. Right. What are you doing? Right. You, you came in and you had a limp. You know, I'm thinking surgery. No, you don't want surgery. You don't have insurance. Um, you know anyone who's got some money and, yeah. you know, maybe, yeah. you know, it's interesting. So this is so many nuggets in here packed in one. Right. Keep going. All right, so, so we got to do the last one. you got to do the last one. So the, the last qualify one. Qualify hard. Of, right. So you've got to qualify 
pain or compelling right. reason to do business. Find the compelling reason. You got to understand that they've got budget and they're willing and able to spend it. And the third thing you have to do is you have to understand how they make a decision. In people's brains, they sort of go through this process of the child wanting it, and then the adult stepping in and saying, hey, wait a minute, before we buy, let's make sure this makes sense. Right. So the adult part of their brain is going to come back and need to justify. Remember we said earlier, people buy emotionally, but they justify intellectually. Right. So we've got them to buy in emotionally, but now we've got to deal with the parent in their brain that's going to say, well, let's justify this intellectually. How are we going to do that? Well, yeah, we got the budget. We got that piece. Now, how are we going to make the decision? How, how's the decision process work? Right. For everybody, it's a little different. So what I want to make sure I understand is how they're going to make the decision. And again, if they give me a problem here, like I can't make the decision by myself, that's not my problem. <laughs> exactly. Um, I like to think about it. That's not my problem again. I like to, uh, I never make a decision in, you know. The same in, day. In the, in the same meeting. Uh, it, okay, it's not my problem. How many, how many beings would you like to have with me before you make your decision for the problem <laughs> you said you have to have solved? Right. It's not, it's not, this is not me. Right. And I can say, I, no, I don't have to agree that I'm going to come back and have another meeting either, but it's... I have to understand how that decision process works so that I can make sure that it fits with mine. Right. Now, at any point during compelling reasons, budget, how they make a decision. If they gave me a problem and I couldn't solve it, or it, it wasn't mine to solve, it was theirs, and they couldn't solve it, would I continue? No. I have now disqualified. So in the position that I'm in, I'm never putting pressure, that uncomfortable, weird pressure yeah. on people. I'm posturing as if, hey, we're two adults here. Let's figure out if it makes sense to take this any further. And if it doesn't, we're done. If you can't figure out how to solve some of the impediments to your wanting to go forward, that's, that's something we'll, you know, we'll figure out when we do need to get back together, but it won't be now. Right. And when I figured that portion of it out, again, I was, I was selling cars for a little bit, and then I was doing this in new home sales with Ryan Holmes, as you know, and I was still coming to the class, figuring the stuff out, and they had good training too, but not like this. I remember those days. Yeah, because this was this is a lot more intense. This is almost like scientific. This is like PhD sales stuff when you're going through each one of these things. And again, the pain, the budget, the decision, pain being compelling reasons. Those are five hour sessions, and uh, there's a unique way to do it. So you can mess each one of these up pretty good if you if you get ahead of yourself. But once I realized I don't have any pressure, right. it's not weird for me because <laughs> I don't have to do anything besides help you out, right? And put the ball back in your court, because I and that. That's key. Now, the difference is, is you now look like a professional, and now you have credibility because they're having to prove to you that they're a real buyer. Right. Okay? And if it's not the right time, respectfully, why would you want to put pressure? Wouldn't you want to say, come back when the time is right? Yeah, of course. So if you've done these three things and you have not disqualified them, I posit to your audience that you've now closed them, and you merely have to come back and fulfill whatever it is they need as validation. Like you may have to bring a contract they can sign right. that says everything you've agreed to. But I have a simple rule. In, in my world, I don't mail anything that we haven't already verbally agreed to. Right. So I, I may still email out a contract, but if you and I were sitting here talking and you said, uh, Matt, um, why don't you give me a proposal and just wrap all that into a proposal of what we've been talking about. And I said, okay, Andrew, I don't like surprises. So I'm going to send you exactly what we talked about, assuming that that's all okay with you. Would I be wrong in doing that? And if and it, you said no, uh, you would not be wrong. That makes right. sense. That's okay. So what we talked about was we talked about this is going to be a $100,000 project. We're going to complete the project in five months. We're going to start work tomorrow. Is any of that wrong? Is there any process you have to go through that I missed? Or is that what you're expecting? That's what we're expecting. And Andrew, when I send it to you, what's going to be the thing that comes up that could prevent it from going forward? Because I don't want to rally the, my resources just to find out that there was actually another thing we had to do first. So you, you're reconfirming the confirm there. That's it. So that's, that's so good. And you know, that's what I do, and so everyone does it a little bit differently. In real estate, they want you to sign a buyer broker agreement. They want you to sign a listing agreement. I tell people, because kind of... I'm. Almost everything I've done is a ripoff of what they, what, what you guys do. No, it's not. It's what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, it's, what's what you, I was told I'm supposed to do, and that's right. what I do, and it, all, it always works, and people like it. I mean, yeah. hey, can we do this? Check out the reviews online. Check out Newberger and Company's reviews, and check out the Sure Sales Group reviews. I, I mean, it works because it's a respectful way to do it. But I always tell people, you don't have to sign anything with me, and even in there, when we do eventually sign something, you can fire me at any time for any reason because I don't. I don't want this to be weird. Let's just, but again, you agree on it first. Like, hey, I'm going to send you the offer. If they don't follow your advice, you should fire them. 
Yeah, no, it's jail. And you just recap and it. Not in a mean way. People sometimes say that as it's some sort of a negative interaction, but adult to adult means two parties agree that they need their criteria to work together. And if there isn't, or, or you can't meet, neither party can meet that criteria. It's so different than a contract on a house. Yeah. If a buyer can't fulfill their end or the seller can't fulfill their end, the contract vo is void. Right. Yeah. So. It's nice to know that up front. Isn't it nice? It used to be an adult and a child. Now it's kind of like an adult adult. That's why people hate sales. They don't want to be the child. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was saying back when I first got started with you guys, it was a lot of adult to child conversations. <laughs> yeah. And now it's like an adult to an adult. I kind of grew up a little bit. Matt made me train in front of the, the classroom once, and I've never been yeah. more scared in my life. He saw my teeth and my face turn white when he, he wanted me to go over the budget step. I remember like, like it was yesterday. I'm sure you still have the tape of it somewhere. Do not release that tape. <laughs> no. You're safe. But, um, so that's Unless awesome. Unless you want to sell that at some point for a lot of money. But, uh, if I ever get into politics, which I won't, <laughs> I could, I'm sure you could hold it against me. Like, this, yeah, will be, this will be released. But you, it, it is a good point. Anything you want to be good at, you should teach. Yeah. If, 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 I mean, make it a rule. Is there, you write down two things you want to be really good at in your life. And if you're not teaching them now, find people to go teach that to because you have to understand it at a completely different level when you teach it, which is why you got so good. Yeah. Well, that, that's how they teach surgeons. See, do, teach. That, I learned that here too. See, do, teach. Here's, we're going to show it to you, then you're going to do it, and then you're going to teach it. And until you can teach it, we're not letting you do it on anyone. Right. Yeah, because it's a different level of understanding that clearly, if you can't clearly articulate what you're doing, how could you possibly execute on it if you don't deep down know it, know it? That's it. Well, Matt, that was a lot of good nuggets. I'm really eating up a lot of your time, your hourly rate. This is free. This is pro bono. This is, this is giving back. This is what we Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Let's talk about, you've been up to some cool stuff. Follow these guys on Facebook, Newberger and Company. They put out training tips every Tuesday. They got a bunch of good coaches. How many guys do you have on the team now? Oh, I don't know. I think I've lost count. So let's, <laughs> let, let's call it eight. Eight coaches, and they're all studs because they, they wouldn't be allowed to do what they do if they weren't. No, they're amazing. Um, they're all good guys, and I know them. Um, but what have you been up to? I know you've been traveling a bit. You're kind of in the Tony Robbins network, which I try to glean nuggets from, and you try to get me to yeah. come. <laughs> and I would, but with the baby at home and stuff. Well, you know, um, so first of all, on the videos, the cool thing about the videos is we always have outtakes at the end. Yeah. So people think we're perfect. Um, that's not the message we're trying to convey. We're as imperfect as anybody else. We forget parts of our process at times. We mess up. Yeah. As long as we can be good most of the time, and we can always get better, we're great. But the nice thing is, is we show people just how imperfect we are with these outtakes at the end yeah. of the videos. So you'll hear all the mistakes we make and the things we say that aren't, don't make any I, sense. I watch every one of them because the training tip, I always think, how would I present that training tip? Because yeah. I've been in the room for long enough. Like, hey, you should come do up. one. But yeah. yeah, no, they're good. <laughs> so follow them on Facebook. Brandon, can we link that up here? Follow Newberger and Company on Facebook. You won't regret it. And then before we get to the goal setting that you yeah. guys do every year, which yeah, is yeah, like yeah. the biggest, probably the most, yeah, the most important thing every year, if you're not setting goals as a professional, especially in sales when you kind of get smacked around a lot because you can't control all of these people, even if you have a great process, goals are the glue that holds kind of your motivation together. And you guys do an awesome workshop, and I'm planning on coming on December 16th. Tell them what you've been up to because I know you've been all over the place learning all kinds of stuff. Okay, so um, for the last year, I've been following Tony Robbins around. Um, you know, I think he, he's a guy that's been doing it for 30 years, and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, my, my thought process was, I don't know how much longer Tony's going to be doing this. Yeah, he's, yeah. So, and he's got his hands in so many different things that, you know, it's, it's not a cheap, it's not yeah, a cheap no, endeavor yeah. by any means, but I think I've been to, what, Amsterdam, London, uh, I've been to Canada. I've been, you know, Florida, San Diego. Of, yeah, San just Diego. in San Diego. Yep, cool. yep a couple times. Um, and uh, you know, the thing that I've learned more than anything else um, from Tony is is a lot of the things that he's good at is because he has understood the principle of managing his own state. And as I look around me, I mean, after being sort of immersed in that environment where you're in a room with 200 people and Tony, over and over and over again, and I actually got the chance to stand up and do some teaching. You actually texted me while I was teaching. Teaching at Tony yeah, Robbins? at Tony Robbins. Hey, when this the room of 200, it was, those are uh, ballers. Uh, that's not like the 10,000 people. That's like, no, let's distill this, this down to the gems. Yeah. And uh, who was the marketing guy that he follows around a lot? Um, um, 
Seth Godin? Jay Abraham. Yeah, yeah. So it was yeah. Tony, Jay Abraham, and about 200 of us, and he said, you know, bring your best idea, and so we all sort of shared our best idea. What was your best idea? Uh, my best idea was this uh, concept called the waterfall technique, which is a way to get to anybody that you want to sell to really effectively. And like immediately, within like a short period of time, like within a couple of days. Don't give it. Don't give it to them. But if you come to the goal setting seminar and you pester them like I always do, you might glean some nuggets. So that's the waterfall yeah. technique. Yeah, that was a, that was a high point. Everybody liked that. And then I know you have a book coming out too. I do want to touch yeah, on that. Five seconds of guts. Five yeah. seconds of guts. I know the concept behind it. I'm not going to tell my little story there because you gave that same five seconds of guts talk, if you will, a segment in one of the sessions, and it, it impacted me a lot. It's kind of about not being a little, uh, not being afraid to do what you know you need to do, and just once you do it, it goes away. But So when's that book coming out? Uh, my hope is that book is coming out next year, first half of the year, and we're in the cleanup mode now, so the book is written and everybody's putting in their You already have the publisher? Uh, we have a publisher within Sandler who's okay. got the initial rights to everything. Sure. But... Um, I think there's probably, you know, room to consider other options. Yeah, because I'd like to it, make some intros just to give back. And just it. so people understand, Newberger & Company is Matt's consulting company. They have the eight coaches and staff and the whole work. Sandler is the franchise. Why don't you just explain the, the dichotomy there? There's Newberger & Company, there's Sandler. Sure. I know Sandler's not all you do, but it's a lot of what you do. Sure. So we would be, I guess the easiest way to put it is we would be like the Ravens in the NFL. We're a franchise owner. We have a couple of different franchises we own. And most of our work is centered out of, our marketing is centered out of the Mid-Atlantic. So we are part of a group of 275 other franchisees around the world. And we work together as colleagues and uh, try to learn a lot from each other in the process. And for us, we've been doing it for 14 years now. And um, we find that Sandler has great name recognition and respect in the processes they use. So we've taken those and we've really just built a consulting model around that. Yeah. So people didn't just have to come to a seminar and put the pieces together for themselves. Yeah, and I know you probably can't say it because you're part of the franchise, but I can say it. And these guys, Newberger and Company, you know, there's this like any NFL teams to use your analogy. There's teams <laughs> that suck and there's teams that are great. And I know you guys have achieved every level. People look at you guys are like the pillar of what a Sandler franchise can be. And I think it's because Obviously, you know, your whole mindset and your abundance, non-scarcity, growing, taking all these things you're learning from all over the country. And the 200 people in that room at these Tony Robbins events, I think, weren't you telling me Ray Dalio was in the room? Ray Dalio was one of the speakers. So that was the financial summit. So Ray Dalio was a speaker there. Peter Diamandis, who's the, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the future. SpaceX guy, yeah. Right. Or not SpaceX. SpaceX is right. But he's yeah. also this, um, he wrote, he was the author of the book Bold. Yeah, yeah. Or, so he's Read really that. talking about sort of how technology is going to change the world. Mm -hmm. um, good rooms and, to be in. Uh, really good rooms. See, you know, it's it's you're, you're meeting with a lot of people to give you yeah. a lot of good ideas. So, so it, that's where we got the we got the Bitcoin idea. The Bitcoin. Matt that told eight, me when the coin was eight hundred dollars a coin. <laughs> Matt told me you were used to be an Alex Brown guy, so you're a uh -huh. finance guy. Yeah. You know what you're talking about. You're not just the rumor mill typical. Hey, buddy, buy this stock. Like Matt knows the deal, knows how to read the charts, the price to earnings ratios, the whole nine. And I kind of do. I used to, and I looked at it every day. Matt told me, that was over a year ago now. So yeah. I remember the day you told it to me because I was kicking myself, buy yeah. Bitcoin. <laughs> I didn't. I bought a ton of another stock, which also, which actually. We had some fun texts on that one. Yeah, yeah. You were, names, you were calling me names. You were calling me names. But. I was, I was, I was, uh, I, I, I was looking to influence you. You wanted to make me rich. <laughs> I wanted to make you rich. He wanted to make me rich, and I told him no. But you know what actually has made me, I actually can't rich just of the mindset of, I know how to work in sales and not be that salesperson. I don't act like a salesperson, and that's all I do is, is sell real estate pretty much and property management and just our service. But I really appreciate you teaching me a lot of, which is pro bono. It takes a lot of someone who's kind of been there, done that, to look at a 22-year-old to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna train you up. And you did. And I know you've done that from some of your other coaches, and I struggle with it. I'm trying to bring on new real estate agents, and I try to think, man, i got to pour myself into him or her because they can be great. And I feel like that's one of your greatest skills. You and your coaches and Chad and Jason, you don't just see what they are. You see what people can be, and I think right. that's unbelievably powerful. And if more people did that with their own employees, 
um, you'd have a lot less turnover and a lot higher profitability. It goes back to the saying, what was it? It's like, what if we train them and they leave? What if we train our people and they leave? And the punchline is, well, you know what's worse? If you don't train them and they stay. Yeah, let's, let's keep all our <laughs> mediocre people here. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's continue yeah. On, that, on that path to mediocrity. Yes. Or mediocrity, yeah. Well, in closing, why don't we wrap it up with the goal-setting seminar? Sure. That's your big thing. Pretty December sure. 16th, Inner Harbor. Or yep. no, it's in Harbor East. Uh, Pier 5. Pier 5. Harbor East, Pier great five. venue. Pier How five. many people can come? I know it's limited. Um, it sells out every year. I think um, we're trying to see now if we can get the room to take 250, um, but we try to keep it. We try to keep it so that we can manage it, right? Because it's a it, we go deep in in the session and we group people off with a, a coach. So I'll be on stage, but then there'll be people, our team, who is every bit as good, and they'll be working more intimately with smaller groups. So our capacity issue is more as in our team's ability to work with a group of people. So yeah, yeah. December nineteenth. So- what would you say to someone, hey, and you know what, Brandon, can you link up? Matt actually already did a video on why you might want to attend or right. why this could be a good fit. But what would you say to someone who goes, man, I've, I've kind of set goals or what can I expect out of this thing or why should I go or goals are cheesy? Because yeah. goals, I already said it, that's your kind of north star. That's your compass. If you don't know what you want, you're not going to get it. Well, I mean, listen, I think it's, I mean, I think a lot of people look at goal setting as uh, with a, a little bit of a sense of like a dismissal, right? Goal setting, stupid. Goal setting, done it, that kind of a thing. And I think it a lot of times just has to do with fear. If you look at the way most of society works today, the idea that you could say something big and bold, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get that, I'm going to own this, I'm going to experience this, I'm going to travel around the world, I'm going to own houses, I'm going to, whatever it is you want, you want to give a lot of money back. My philosophy is, is that most people really, you know, the, They've already defeated themselves. And there's this, you've got to understand that if, if you want to have a, just an extraordinary life, you got to get past the fact that people are going to make fun of you. <laughs> they are. That's true. You yeah. said something at some point where I wanted to achieve this, and somebody laughed at you, and the little guy or gal inside of you said, yeah, who do you think you're kidding? And you went back to who you thought you should be, your little place, because that fits in your surroundings. Everybody reinforces that. People, the people that love you don't want you to get successful. They'll, they may not be able to hang out with you anymore, right? And so there's this, you know, this philosophy that proximity is power. Right. The people you hang out with create your environment. And you know this because I have a group of friends, and they have a standard of living. And I have to, I have to rise to that standard of living. It's really freaking uncomfortable. But these are people that um, have a lifestyle that's really amazing. And by the mere fact that they have those things, I've found myself having all the things that they have by the mere fact that I hang out with them. Great friends. Somebody, you know, uh, one's a CEO of a company who's sold his company for $2 billion. B? Billion? With a B. $2 billion. He He, hangs out with you? He hangs out with me. I'll give you a copy (laughs) of his book if you want it. He's got a great book out called The, uh, The Dunlap Principles. And what an amazing guy. But to hang out with him changes all of my thinking. And he's a guy that if I say, I want to do this, and it's a big grand goal, and there's no clear path to how I'm going to do that, he's behind it. But if I go tell one of my buddies who's um, behind on his, on his payments and, you know... You almost can't even tell him because you feel bad. For well, one. you feel bad, but first of all, he's going to laugh at you because it's uncomfortable. But if you look at anybody who's accomplished anything in life, they, they, they don't give... I don't know if this is PG or R, but they don't You care. say whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> they, don't, they don't give a shit. They don't give a shit about what other people think. If, you're, if you don't have goals that would make your friends laugh at you, then, my friend, you're not pushing yourself. You know that. I mean, look where you are. I mean, Man, I you, were, you were selling cars. I know. I was making a lot of money. I was making a lot of money. At least I thought I was. How many, how many people were you working with in their 50s? who would have laughed at you if you said, I'm going to be where you are now? I'm not sure if anyone's laughed at me to my face or not, but what does happen is when I've set these goals and I try to make them big, I would have never believed. I've been doing the resale side of the business, general brokerage, so I've been in the industry for eight years, three with new home sales, five kind of as an outdoor cat out here doing the resale. If someone told me that I would sell 450 houses in one year, I would have 
I would have laughed at myself. I mean, I was like, that's stupid. Okay, obviously, let's just try to get a little bit going. Right. But I, I hit it. And the next goal, and I'll, I'll make it public here, my, one of my passions is I want to be one of the elite, rarefied people that sells 1,000 homes in one year. And I can only think of two people in this marketplace that have done it, or three. Um, and you know their names are on the Super Bowl commercials, those guys. But we're, we can get there. And it's just it takes more people in the right places and the right mindset and, and bringing other people up. Yep. And, and the thing is, is that I think most people overestimate what they can do in a short period of time, but underestimate what they can do in a lifetime. By the fact that you set that goal, at some point you're going to have to change it because you'll hit it, and there's going to have to be a new goal. Right. Well, I'll come back next year. Okay. Let's make it the first guy to sell 2,000 homes. 2,000 homes. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, that's a lot of commission how, checks. How, how, ta-ching, ta-ching, ta-ching. how would you have to reorganize and restructure your time? Because yeah. that's possible. We know that in your market, more than 2,000 homes get sold in a year. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's like 2,000 like a month or something. So, but you would have to think differently about your business if you made that the goal. Now, you may not get it in a year, but you may get it in a couple of years, which is still okay. Yeah. So I'll give it to you kind of quick in, in terms of what this session is and what we're trying to get people to do. Okay. The first thing we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to get past level zero thinking. Level zero thinking and self-talk means... It's more important what people think of me, and I'd be afraid to set real goals because I would either fail or people would laugh at me. So on some level, they won't allow themselves to feel success because in some way, success in their brain is actually wrong. If I, I want a lot of money, but if I made a lot of money, it would be wrong because money is dirty, right? Root of, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, there's you all know, the cliches. You got all the cliches. But... I'm telling you, I, I talk with people all the time, and the first thing I have to get past the fact is their psychology, their level zero talk and thinking to themselves is so lousy, and they're so unaware of it, that setting goals is BS for them. It's a lie. Because their, con- their mental construct, their blueprint of how life is supposed to work is they can't be wealthier than their parents, they can't be successful or with friends, whatever it is, and we eliminate that. But then sort of level one talking is, all right, um, I just can't. Level two is, I should. Level three is, I'll try. Zero through three are BS. Because what you're doing on some level is lying to yourself. And the reason most people can't set goals is because they can't get past level three into level four. So what we do, it's really the first part of the day is breakthroughs. How to reframe that 90% psychology factor that allows you to be successful. Listen, I mean, we're living in a time, and you, it's, you, everyone your listeners are hearing this all the time. Anything that you can imagine you want, it's easier now to get it than it ever was. That's so true. It's, it's just a question yeah. of, are, are you gutsy enough to actually ask for what you want? When I go to a hotel and I don't like my room, I go back to the front desk and I say, I need another room. I don't like my room. Yeah. But and when I talk to my friends, they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm not really happy, but it, it's okay. And I'm like, no, man, we're going to be here for a week. You just, you're paying for this. Make it exactly the way you want to be really clear People on it. always are willing to help you too. Yeah. I've got out of my own way. Like I'm asking you for stuff all the time. I'm asking all these people to come and talk with me so I can get some of the, the cred here just to, right. to support my business. Everyone's always willing to help. I don't think I've met someone who I had some level of relationship with. I don't go up to strangers who don't know me, but everyone's willing to help. You know, there's a, a, a very quick story, but we'll get back to the point. Um, one of my good friends now is uh, a friend, and it, it sounds like something that would be an Apple product. Her name is Siri Lindley. Siri Lindley? And she's become a good friend of mine, and she is, at, at, in her time, she no longer she's retired, was the number one female triathlete in the world. Triathlete. Triathlete. Running, right? jumping, swimming? Uh, well, probably, Bike, Oh, biking. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but hardcore re- stuff. Re- re- hardcore stuff. And... Here's a woman who has all the success in the world, has people knocking on her door constantly. I've asked her for help, and I'm telling you, I mean, yesterday I get a text from her asking me how I'm doing and checking in with me. This is a woman who does not need me for anything, yet has become a a huge mentor of mine, Fred uh, Fred, uh, Dunlap, who I mentioned to you earlier. Right. He, you know, I asked him to come to my office to do an interview. He's he's doing an interview. He's talking about all the secrets. Um, You're right. Anything you ask for, you can have. No, you may not get it right away, but you'll yeah. get it. Yeah. So if, you know, if you don't lie to yourself and you follow up and don't make up a story in your head why you're never going to get it, it's either you kind of either have the story why you're not going to get it or the story why you're going to get it. 
Right. I like the story where I'm going to get it. Right. And I feel like when I think about that, that's I, I get what I want a lot of times. And so your biggest challenge, which is really cool, is the second part, which is now that I'm not afraid to get it, and if, and if you're stuck in that, I'm afraid to get it, at this goal-setting session, we break through that. But I always tell people, listen, I think we charge, I mean, this is a give. It, we have to rent out Pier 5, we have to feed people, and we charge 200 bucks. Yeah. So it's not, we're not making money on this. But I can't tell you how many people say, ah, uh, we do goal setting like how much money uh, we want to make in the next year. I'm like, that's not it, man. It's, it's like, wh what's, what's a perfect day in your life look like? And how many of those days do you want to live? And so we break through all those mental challenges. So if you're like, man, I just don't even know how to get my head around having bigger goals or anything like that, then just come. We'll, uh, you, my promise is we'll fix you or I'll give you your $200 back. You can still eat your lunch. I won't take your lunch back. But it's... It's that simple. So we want to fix that first. And the thing that I see, and I don't judge people on it, but I understand, most of social construct is about staying where you are so you can feel okay. The problem is, is feeling okay is not growth. And you've got to grow. Everybody has to grow because the world's constantly changing. You've got to grow. Got to change. Got to right? adapt. They say all growth happens outside your and comfort you zone. Stay, yeah, if you want to stay comfortable and you can't fix your psychology, then at some point you're going to find yourself under or unemployed. I just I hate to say it, man, but I'm saying that because I want people to get into action here. Well, it's true. The world's changing in such a way. We were talking about it before. What did you say? 3% of the jobs are going to be taken in the next how many years? Oh, yeah. In the next five years, they're saying a lot of the transportation jobs will be wiped out. They're saying definitely in the next 10 to 15 years, 3% of these people involved in transportation that are they're gone. Get a new job. They're replaced. You won't need a driver of a car. Hey, what about manufacturing? They're saying steering wheels won't even be in cars. I mean, you buy a car, there'll be no steering wheel. I love that. Yeah. You won't need a garage because, you know, you're, you're, you know, you don't need to own a car. I mean, right now, they're building the Hyperloop, what, in D.C.? Right now, that's yeah, happening. Yeah, the boring. That's under construction. Elon. Please don't go bankrupt Elon. <laughs> I heard he's spending a lot of money. But at the same point, here's a guy who's, who said, I'm going to create a car company, a rocket company, uh, 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 an underground transportation company, a Hyperloop. Um, everybody laughed at him. You couldn't, everyone in the car industry said, you can't build a car company right now. Now, so most people know, his car company, while it doesn't make the most number of cars, has the largest, largest market cap of any car company. Yeah. It's yeah. the biggest. So if your goals aren't ones that people are laughing at and you're too afraid and then, uh, you know, you're selling yourself short and you're building a story in your head that you don't have the capability. And that's a thing that we break through. So you're going to be in a room of people that want to break through that. But the second thing is, then we've got to figure out the mechanics of how you do that. So we have to create two things. And this is really it. Most people create a bunch of goals that they really don't need. So... There's a study that's shown that if you have too many goals, you don't achieve any of them. You have too little, you don't achieve any. There's really sort of this sweet spot for how many goals you should have. How many is it? Do you got to well, come? Do we have to come to get that? No, I, I, I'm happy to share. It's not about keeping secrets here because we work on this stuff. But three to five must-have goals that are very specific are typically the highest win percentage or the highest three to five. completion. Three to five. And if you get way about, you know, some people have like 20 goals. The problem is, is when you've, you've ever written out 20 goals, a lot of them you're like, yeah, I don't care. It's not something <laughs> I really wanted, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but it's three to five must-haves. Three to five must-haves. But here's the problem. And what I say is, is that, and, and it's, it's not something that I actually made. If somebody else, I can't remember who said it first, but it's not that we need more goals. It is that it, we need more standards. So first, we're going to help you create standards in your life. In other words, if I came and tried to take your wallet from you out of your, you know, out of your pocket, well, hopefully you have a standard that says, I'm not going to let somebody take my wallet from me, right? But there's too many areas where you don't set a standard, where people are taking things or circumstances or situations are taking things from you all the time. So what I believe is, is you have to have a standard by the way you live your life. You have to understand what standard of a home you live in, what standard of a relationship do you want, what standard of income do you want, what standard of travel do you want. What standard of contributing back to other people, not just taking, but actually giving? What's your standard? Because if you don't have that and you're not clear and passionate about it, it's not in you. I mean, it's not wired into you. Then your goals are going to be really hard to achieve. But then with your goals, you have to create not just a goal, but a very clear, specific picture of what that is. The most successful people in our firm and in the clients we work with 
you can come. You, you come into. I invite you to come into our office and look at our, uh, our the way that we depict these, and you're going to see the people that make the most money, have the most fulfillment, the happiest people, the the people that are spending the most time traveling, getting everything they want out of their life, have a very clear picture of what those goals. They look literally like. have the picture. They literally have a picture. It's like the vision board. Yeah. 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 I have one. And there's massive accountability to it. So we anchor this into your system so that you just, you live it, you breathe it, you feel it, you realize it every day. And you can go do this, you know, you, you can go do this at home if you want. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's a different experience. This is about mastering your life. And so for us, we have to master the way we think about things, the way we talk to ourselves. You're encanting something to yourself every day. Most people don't know this. You know, most people think of like incantations are kind of a silly, stupid right, thing. Right, right. But I got to tell you, everybody's saying something to themselves every day. And if you're watching... This, I hate myself. <laughs> oh, I'm ugly today. My, is, what I'm saying right now is my forehead oily. Was, right, right. Like, <laughs> you got it. But you know, you, it's, you yeah. know, like I tell people, like, the reason I'm a beast now and the way like, I don't take a lot of bullshit just and I get what I want... Just say that. Yeah. yeah, well, just... It's because look what I've been hanging out with for the last eight years. And when I come up with something, I say, hey, how do you guys solve this? And they tell me and I just go do it. So you guys need training out there. If you're a manager, if you're a salesperson, if you're a real estate team leader, if you're a lender, if you deal with the public and you have any of these problems, and we could diagnose the problems all day, and I still run into problems every day. They're not going away. It's just how you deal with them. You need to get training. And if you're in sales, I feel like there's nowhere. It's just we're lucky to have, I'm pretty sure, I know it's a private company, private franchises, but it's like the number one Sandler franchise on the planet Earth. I know you guys aren't intergalactic yet, but planet Earth, <laughs> they're right here. We're, we're talking at the to core. about Mars. That's a, that's a conversation we're working on. You got to get with the, get with the program. And, uh, I feel like my ROI, cause you know, I I was getting this training for free and then I realized I need, you took it away from me when I wasn't going to come. There, there came to a point where Matt said, Hey, you can't just come for free anymore. And I said, Oh shit. Cause I can't really afford to go, but I need to go. Like I needed to come to this cause I wasn't. I, I was still sharpening my tools and, and honing my craft. And um, anyway, if we could link up, find them on Facebook, hit up one of the coaches. I, is there a way? Here's my ask of you. Mm -hmm. Can you give anyone who reaches out one session with one of your coaches just to kind of do the initial? I know that's, I know that's a big ask, but there's going to be people who are reaching out, probably other realtors. Is this our by the way? This is not our oh, by the way. Okay. <laughs> We got a by the way coming. So oh oh by the way okay. So I just now we have to do another one. I think we talked. That was supposed to be our oh by the way. It's not anymore. You'll do it. I'll just have to give more stuff. Give away um, everything. I, I, here here's the deal. Um, I love. Uh, we have a value system here in the company, and we really refer to values and standards as the same thing. And I love working with people that um, have a standard of, you know, just getting out there and wanting to to just dominate. I love working with those people. So yeah, would we would we let them uh, talk to a coach or something like that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. If you heard anything you liked and you wanted to dive deeper on it, because we covered a lot: buyer process, upfront contracts, qualifying, pain budget decision, um, goal setting. There's just so much content there that we kind of just we're teasing you with it. But you got to get in front of someone who this is all these guys do all day, every day is train people on how to be great at that, and these are skills that. Sales or not, you kind of need them for life, uh, influence. Um, so in closing, Matt, appreciate you being a mentor of mine for the last eight years. I feel like I was very lucky. It all started with my mom making me get a job right when I came home from college selling cars, like not a glorious job. Thank God I did it. I met Chad. I met you. And off I went. Yep. So uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Anytime, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, by the way, um, you know, I think one of the things that you know, you've mentioned a bunch of times, which I really want to, you know, I guess give some, you know, give some credit to. Yeah. yeah. You, you've, you know, you've done a lot by being really tenacious with us and getting as much value as you could. So I want to give people the opportunity to be you. <laughs> yeah. So, that's a gift and a curse. Here, here's a, well, yeah, you decide. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think one of the things you've done that I really respect is, is that you have really worked hard to get as much from us as you could and in the most economical way possible. So I think what makes sense as a give is, that we'll give five seats at $100 instead of $200 to the goal setting event if you mention the show. So if you mention this show and you want to attend, and again, it's going to be the first five seats because, again, we tend to max out. So I'm going to have to go find five chairs somewhere. 
but we'll get you into the event. We'll get you in for 100 bucks. We'll feed you. We'll give you a day. And I promise you, we will change your life. So I think that's the oh, by the way. And I hope you take us up on it, but take us up right away because, again, it's going to be five seats. Awesome. Until next time. Thanks. <laughs>